was illegal. I mean, are you worried? Are you worried that someone, police are going to come and drag you off the stage? No, not at all. Um, you know, medical cannabis is legal in 23 states in the District of Columbia in the U.S. And retail cannabis is legal in four states and D.C. as well. Plus, we operate globally, so we operate in other countries where medical cannabis is also legal. Right, so you feel like it's a safe business for you to be involved in? You're not worried about police coming in now and busting you? Not, not at all. Uh, you know, in Canada, we operate the world's largest federally licensed medical cannabis grow uh, at a company, uh, one of our subsidiaries called Tilray. It's about 60,000 square feet of uh, plants and processing equipment, and then every day uh, we ship uh, boxes of medical cannabis to patients all across Canada. So how much, how much marijuana does, does that, do you produce there? So, uh, let's see, we have about 40 rooms um, that each have about five harvests a year, uh, and each harvest is about 100 pounds. 100 pounds, yes. wow, it's a lot, a lot of wheat. It is. <laughs> So um, you've got three businesses now. Could you, do you want to tell us what the, what, the, what the three businesses are now? You've mentioned Tilray. But sure, so Tilray, uh, which operates in Canada and is about to operate in a few other uh, medical cannabis countries. Uh, we operate a firm called Leafly, which is an online and app resource for uh, cannabis patients and cannabis consumers to look at strains, uh, to find the right strain for them. So. Someone who has glaucoma can see what other medical cannabis strains glaucoma patients are using. Someone who uh, wants to uh, rela relax after a long week on a Friday night can find a, a strain to relax. Uh, once they find the right strain, uh, we list about 2,500 dispensaries around the world that carry uh, the specific strain that someone is looking for. And then the third company is a, a company that we announced uh, about six months ago called Marley Natural and the intent is for Marley Natural to be a global uh, retail cannabis brand. That's, so I think we'll get to the, well, the Marley thing in a minute because it's fascinating. Um, but I'm just, just to go back to where we came in, I mean, where, where are we in the prohibition debate? I mean, we were talking earlier, I wondered if you think there's a parallel with what happened with gay marriage. Do you know how it's this hodgepodge of legislation across the US, some states where it's medical marijuana is legal, some where it's recreational, some where it's entirely illegal. It seems like a very complicated landscape to, 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 for you as a company to deal with. How do you see it developing? It's, it's very complicated. We like that it's complicated from state to state, from country to country. Um, you know, we're at a, a stage where the 75-year experiment uh, where, of prohibition is about to end. Uh, currently in the U.S., about 58% of Americans believe that cannabis should be legal. Uh, about 85% of Americans believe that medical cannabis should be legal. Um, you, can't you, get, you, you, you can't get 85% of Americans to agree on anything. No, that's right? very true. But I mean, how has that changed? So, uh, it's changed rapidly over the last 20 to 25 years, very similar to uh, gay marriage uh, without, without the religious opposition. Uh, as you, as you poll younger uh, people, they're overwhelmingly in support of legalization. So it's very much led by younger generations. Definitely, uh, younger generations. Um, it's not a political issue like most people think. Uh, a lot of our investors come from the far left and the far right. Um, even in in states like Iowa, where the Iowa caucus will be held. Uh, Republicans are overwhelmingly in favor of legalization. Right. And one of the, I think one of the, I think one of the first times I spoke to you uh, was when after Peter Thiel and the Founders Fund invested in you. Obviously, that's a, you don't get more blue chip in terms of backers than that. So, what? So how did that come about, and how did he take an interest in? When I, mean, I know he has an interest in things on a cutting edge. I mean, how did he? How did you get together? Sure. So our, our first round was $7 million. It was, it was the hardest round uh, I've ever raised in my life. We started it about uh, four years ago. Um, and we, we announced a, a $75 million round uh, about a year ago. And it was, uh, it was a much easier, it was a much different environment. 
and um, the Founders Fund approached us about 16 months before actually we closed them. Um, and it, it led to a series of conversations that, that took place around the country and, and in Canada where they came to visit some of our operations. Uh, for them, they were, you know, they were looking for, um, they were looking for a, a company in this industry that, that had an audacious vision for how the post-prohibition world would look. And uh, we, we have a series of companies that operate within different verticals within cannabis, and they, they see the, the inevitability of the end of prohibition. Um, so we were, we were thrilled to uh, receive an investment from them. It certainly helped us close uh, other large institutional investors, uh, you know, seven and eight figure investments. So what, what I, I like, to, um, yes, I like to say it gave other smart institutional investors uh, permission to, to look at this industry. It, you know, it certainly helped us, but um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, and it, it really helped other firms in this industry as well. Right, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, was, was before that investment, what is it like going to <coughs> sort of VCs and saying, hey, want to invest some money in my weed project? I mean, was it kind of so we, difficult? You know, I came from Silicon Valley, and so you know, five years ago, we told a few partners at a number of VC firms that we were doing this, mostly so they would sort of understand that we weren't crazy. We knew we would never get capital from them. All of our investors are high net worth individuals and family offices from around the United States and around the world uh, who wouldn't agree on any other topic other than their desire to end prohibition and the harms caused by prohibition. I mean, what, do you, what do you think of those harms are and how, how do you think it's still affecting people? Oh, so you know, we have investors who have used medical cannabis personally or someone in their family has used medical cannabis uh, either legally or illegally in a, in a state where it's not legal and they're motivated to enable other patients to access medical cannabis. Other investors um, are, see this as a progressive issue where we're incarcerating 850,000 Americans last year for cannabis possession or distribution, overwhelmingly African Americans and Hispanic Americans, disproportionately. Um, you know, others see this as an individual civil liberties issue or a states' rights issue. So, you know, our investors, they come from the right, they come from the left, and they, they come from the middle. Right. And I assume a large percentage of them also see this as a potentially very lucrative market. They do. They, 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 all, they all see the inevitability, and that's, that's really what's different about, about this investment. You know, a lot of investments have technology risks or, um, you know, market acceptance risks. We already know that there's a market for this. We already know that people consume this product. All we're, all we're seeing is that this industry is in a state of transition or transformation from a state of prohibition to a state of legalization. And there's not really another comparison other than the end of alcohol prohibition in the 30s. Right, so you could be the Seagrams, though they started off, uh, the Bronfman family started as whiskey runners, didn't they? And then <laughs> That's certainly an industry that we studied a yeah. lot. We looked at what Joseph B. Kennedy uh, yeah. did, and we looked at what the Bronfman family right. did. Um, so I would, that moves us neatly onto this, because the Marley Naturals, which is the you know, first big marijuana brand that, you know, you obviously struck a deal with the, the Marley family. That's kind of an incredible brand to have in marijuana. How, how, how on earth did you manage to pull that off? So <clears throat> I, was working on, I was working on two big deals at the same time. Uh, we were approached by the family of Bob Marley about two years ago. Uh, certainly, um, we couldn't think of a larger global cultural icon that was more closely tied to this product than, than Bob Marley. Um, and so it was, a, it was a natural fit for us. Um, and so I was working on that deal and meeting with uh, his wife, Rita, and his 11 children around the country, around the world, talking to them about this opportunity. At the same time, I was meeting with the uh, investors from Founders Fund. Because so were they worried that, because you know, Bob Marley's image is so overused and ripped off, you know, you walk through Venice Beach or you go through uh, St. Mark's Place in New York, all these places used to just countless images of Bob Marley that I assume the family gets nothing for. I mean, how did you kind of reassure them that you weren't um, going to take 
the name in vain. So, so part of it was they were looking at uh, product design. So we have about, um, about 50 different product uh, items that we're working on that range from Jamaican cannabis strains to uh, accessories, uh, you know, consumption devices and storage devices for cannabis. And then there's a whole line of uh, cannabis and hemp infused topicals. Uh, so we, we've been working on about 50 different items over the last uh, year and we'll launch uh, Marley Natural in the US and uh, likely in, in Jamaica um, by the end of the year, by November. So the US and, US and Jamaica, the first two markets. That's, that's the first two markets. I've been spending, you know, I have a, a, there are a lot of things that are unusual about my job. Um, you know, I spent, I've spent two weeks over the last, I guess, month and a half walking uh, cannabis fields in, in Jamaica. You know, certainly uh, something I never imagined doing, um, yeah. but trying to understand uh, what that what that market looks like and what are the growing techniques outdoors in in Jamaica. Right. And what's that? Because I mean, I mean, we talk about Jamaica. I mean, clearly there's still this isn't a legal industry now. I mean, is it? Are there difficulties for you working in this industry? I mean, is there a kind of you know, this, Jamaica is notoriously crime ridden. Is there? Is, how how's it working? So Jamaica has really seen what has been taking place in the United States and is is really rapidly legalizing. So over the last three months, we've been meeting with ministers, we've been meeting with regulators, looking at uh, their regulations, and they will issue the first uh, permits this, this summer. So uh, they'll issue R&D permits, they'll issue grow permits, and they'll start, um, it looks like they'll start selling medical, or allowing the sale of medical cannabis uh, this, this fall, so September, October. Um, it's been amazing to see and they're doing it in, in response to uh, what's happening in Colorado and Washington State. Jamaica's known for this product, and they don't, they don't want to be left out. Right, so, so you mentioned Colorado and Washington State. I mean, those are very, those are very interesting models for how we proceed. With, uh, how do you think the kind of recreational market is shaping up here? Do you see more, more states following that route? Yeah, so in November 2012, we saw Colorado and Washington. Uh, last November, we saw uh, three, three locations, uh, Alaska, Oregon, and Washington, D.C., legalized for uh, recreational purpose. And we'll, we'll see another, I think, six states in the next 18 months, um, which is absolutely fascinating to see. You know, Colorado and Washington are very different, and I think Oregon will be different yet again from those two markets. And so each state is, is experimenting with the right types of, of regulations. Right. I think over the next... I think over the next 18 months, we will see the federal government allow states to legalize medical cannabis. The, there's, an, there's a bill in the Senate right now that has 14 co-sponsors, uh, seven Republicans, seven Democrats, who are interested in um, having the federal government give states permission to experiment, um, you know, run an experiment with democracy. Right, so I mean, if we go back to the gay marriage analogy, obviously it's very different uh, but but it's, do you think we'll end up in, in a position where um, we could have a Supreme Court case, where we could have like a federal legalization, maybe to start off with a medical level? You know, I, I don't think we'll see a Supreme Court case. I think we'll see uh, either the, the new head of the DEA, the president, or Congress m move to legalize medical cannabis. And I think we'll see it fast. You know, unlike, um, unlike gay marriage, Cannabis doesn't have the religious opposition. Um, you know, in, in every state, there's no strong opposition to legalization, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, I guess the similarity is, uh, you know, as I travel around the world and travel around the country over the last five years, um, you know, people, people come out of the cannabis closet to me, right. and it's, it's still something that, that they hide, um, yeah. you know, they don't admit to publicly in some places. Um, but it, you know, our fundamental premise is that this is a mainstream product consumed by mainstream Americans. Yeah. And they're just looking for professional companies and professional brands that, that they can relate to, brands that don't uh, offend or insult them. Yeah, it's kind of, you said the, the cannabis closet, because clearly in Clinton we had a president who uh, notoriously didn't inhale, and, and now we have uh, Obama who clearly did. So it's kind of, it's been a very big generational shift in no, Attitude definitely, and, and I think I think that's part of what's changing the the cultural perception, right? 
You, you have a president who, you know, the past three presidents have admitted to consuming this product, and it's, you know, the younger generations are offended by the hypocrisy of saying that you know, these presidents consume this product, but we should still be arresting 850,000 Americans for, for doing the exact same thing. It's, yeah. it's ludicrous. So what's next for you guys? We obviously erased this money. What do you want to do with it? I mean, I guess it's interesting with the audience here. If <clears throat> what are the kind of ideas you are interested in investing in, in, in cannabis, and what are the kind of ideas that don't kind of light your pipe, so to speak? <laughs> So generally, we don't, we're not very interested in products, so we're not interested in you know, the next cool vaporizer uh, or the next testing company, things like that, things that are going to be uh, commodities. You know, we are, we are very interested in brands. We're very interested in the brands that will be sold in uh, medical cannabis dispensaries and the brands that will be sold in retail stores. We think that, uh, we think that the right brands can fuel change. The right brands can create and imply legitimacy, legitimacy and that's, that's our focus. You know, we think we can build brands that will help end prohibition, not only in the United States, but around the world. Right. And do you, do you, do you think that the big, you're talking about brands, do you, do you imagine big brand companies, I guess most obviously big tobacco are going to get into this space? You know, I don't, I don't think big tobacco will. I don't think they ever will. I think that, um, I think that some big consumer product companies will, some big retail stores will. Um, I think there's a possibility that some alcohol companies will. Um, you know, alcohol is a lot about branding. You know, I can't tell the difference between Grey Goose and Belvedere, um, but there's a lot of branding between those two. Um, you know, I also think that cannabis is a substitute for alcohol in some states, and so as states legalize, you see alcohol sales decrease slightly. Um, so I think we'll see more brands emerge. I, I also think we'll see more uh, celebrity brands in this particular industry than a lot of other industries. Is Snoop? Uh, yes. So he has, you know, he, he is announcing uh, a few products in this industry and. Um, has started to look at possible investments in this industry as well. Right. So, I mean, it all sounds like it's going swimmingly well. I mean, is there, is there anything that kind of keeps you awake at night? Do you worry that, you know, the next president might be uh, more hostile? We haven't the DEA's, obviously, head of the DEA is obviously changing as well. I mean, that's expected to go your way. But are there, are there things that, that worry you about how this is developing? You know, the, the, last two, the last two pieces that we need to change in the U.S. are the bureaucrats and the politicians. They're, they're the last people to accept that this is a mainstream product and that mainstream Americans believe that it should be legal. Um, you know, there are certain presidential candidates like Chris Christie who uh, are opposed to legalization. They're, he's a strong prohibitionist. Um, but we think that both political parties will embrace legalization on their presidential campaigns um, in the next year and a half. Well, I don't think you're going to have to worry about Chris Christie anymore anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but Brendan, thank you very much. Fascinating talking to you. Thanks thank you. Lot. Thanks so much.